right, my name is James White. It is time to dive into all sorts of things, including your phone calls at 877-753-3341, 877-753-3341. Are we ever going to do Skype again? Maybe not yet. Someday, possibly. I mean, it was easier it, for people overseas to use that. That's true. It, if I can find a round to it around here somewhere, I, I'm fresh out of them. Oh, okay. All right. Just wondered. We just hadn't done it in months. So, anyways, um, <clears throat> 877-753-3341. Yesterday morning, I would love to have been a mouse in the corner uh, at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, when uh, Dr. Albert Moeller of the Southern Baptist Seminary um showed up to uh, speak to them at their invitation, by the way. Uh, he didn't just <laughs> show up like certain people showed up at the Strange Fire Conference uh, just to pass out uh, stuff, uh, which I found uh, about, I don't know, uh, about a, a seventh grade level activity. But anyway, um, here is uh, some of uh, Dr. Moeller's comments, and I want to start the program off with these. I have come to Brigham Young University. I think I said Brigham Young University there. I have come to Brigham Young University. There we go. Because I intend with you to push back against the modernist notion that only the accommodated can converse. There are those who sincerely believe that meaningful and respectful conversation can take place only among those who believe the least. That only those who believe the least and and thus may disagree the least can engage one another in the kind of conversation that matters. I reject that notion, and I reject it forcefully. To paraphrase Dorothy Parker, that is the kind of idea that must not be cast aside lightly, but thrown with full force. I come as a Christian theologian to speak explicitly and respectfully as a Christian, a Christian who defines Christianity only within the historic creeds and confessions of the Christian Church, and who comes as one committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the ancient and eternal Trinitarian faith of the Christian Church. (laughs) I have not come as less, and you know whom you have invited. I come knowing who you are, to an institution that stands as the most powerful intellectual center of the Latter-day Saints, the most visible academic institution of Mormonism. You know who I am and what I believe. I know who you are and what you believe. Wow. Wow. Um, And then it, it got even more direct. Later on, this is what brings me to bringing me, bringing me, I'm starting to think about, about back when we used to, we used to record these phone messages from Mormons. And one night, uh, we were trying to record one that had the name Brigham Young in it. It wasn't me that was trying to say it. It was somebody else. But every time we got to it, he couldn't say it right. And it turned into one of those things where everyone's just laughing their heads off. And it took three hours to record a, you know, 10 minute thing. That's how I'm feeling about Brigham Young today. This is what brings me to Brigham Young University today. I am not here because I believe we are going to heaven together. I do not believe that. I believe that salvation comes only to those who believe and trust only in Christ and in his substitutionary atonement for salvation. I believe in justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. I love and respect you as friends. And as friends, we would speak only what we believe to be true, especially on matters of eternal significance. We inhabit separate and irreconcilable theological worlds made clear with respect to the doctrine of the Trinity. And yet here I am, and gladly so, we will speak to one another of what we most sincerely believe to be true precisely because we love and respect one another. Then I love this next line. I'm going to have to ask Dr. Mueller when he thought of this one. I do not believe that we are going to heaven together, but I do believe we may go to jail together. (laughs) What a line. Wow. I do not believe that we are going to heaven together, but I do believe we may go to jail together. I do not mean to exaggerate, but we are living in the shadow of a great moral revolution that we commonly believe will have grave and devastating human consequences. Now, the one thing that Dr. Moley didn't touch on, and I don't know how he could have, is right now we are already hearing the voices coming forward to legalize and establish polyamory and polygamy. And what will Salt Lake do if all of a sudden polygamy becomes legal? Which could happen like next year at the, at the rate things are going. What do they do now? The only reason they stopped, there was no revelation. There was nothing that came down from heaven that made section 132 invalid any longer. That's still right there. 
So what does Mormonism do if polygamy is allowed under the United States Constitution? Well, un- it's, it's not under the United States Constitution. The, the Constitution's irrelevant any longer. It's, it's, it's been, it's just give it up, folks. It's, it's gone. It's history. And once it became a living document where the words no longer mean anything, there is one person, well, two, maybe, on the Supreme Court that actually believes you should interpret that within the context which it was written, what the founders meant. Otherwise, everybody else, even the alleged conservatives, uh, it's just sort of Plato, you know, just do with it what you want. Sort of like liberals, the Bible, you know, just form it into whatever you want, and that's all there is to it. Anyway, that would be an interesting thing uh, to find out what uh, what Salt Lake would do. Um, we'll see. Anyway, uh, one other th- cultural thing here from Bill Muhlenberg. This was uh, from a little over a week ago, but this is, just was truly amazing. Um, talking about uh, infanticide. Consider the recent case of infanticide. If this does not shake you up, then you are already dead. A woman who strangled and killed her newborn baby has been released and will face no jail time thanks to a judge who cited support for legalized abortion in Canada, where abortions are legal and paid for at taxpayer expense. Katrina Effort of Wetaskiwin, Alberta, gave birth secretly in the downstairs level of her parents' home <clears throat> and then killed her baby son by throwing his body over the fence of their yard. Effort 19 at the time of the infanticide told the court she worried about what her parents would think of having to listen to the cries of a newborn baby in the house. Effort's parents were not aware of the pregnancy, and she initially told police that she had not had sexual intercourse. The boy was named Rodney, and Effort reportedly used a pair of her own underwear to strangle him and take his life before tossing his body into her parents' neighbor's yard. On Friday, Effort... Now, I mean, that's bad enough. I mean, that, that's... That's just so horrific that you, you just want to stop and ask what is happening that, 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 that the natural love of a mother for a child could be just so completely abandoned and, and, and all this. But it gets worse. On Friday, Effort received a three-year suspended sentence from Justice Joanne Veit of the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench, and because of the ruling, she was able to go free on probation and face no time in prison for killing her child. Judge Veit issued the verdict in part because she heard testimony from witnesses that Effort faced severe persecution in prison, where fellow inmates called her baby killer. But part of the ruling was also that also has pro-life advocates troubled is Judge Veit's decision that Canada's acceptance of legalized abortion entitled Effort to kill her child. Judge Veit ruled, according to multiple media reports, that because Canada allows abortions, it reflects how, while many Canadians undoubtedly view abortion as a less-than-ideal solution to unprotected sex and unwanted pregnancy, they generally understand, accept, and sympathize with the onerous demands pregnancy and childbirth exact, exact from mothers, especially mothers without support. There you go. Kill your newborn and walk free. After all, if raising a child is a bit onerous, the obvious thing is to kill him or her. That must be great news to millions of parents who find their teenagers to be onerous and a burden as well. Great. We can now just kill them with impunity. A case out of New York is not much better. A 17-year-old student and mother of a 2-year-old boy shocked security officers at Victoria's Secret Store in Herald Square, New York City on Thursday when they fingered her for shoplifting sexy lingerie, but lingerie, but found the decomposing corpse of a baby boy in her bag as well. The girl, according to CBS News New York report, was leaving the store on Thursday with a 17-year-old friend when they were both stopped by security guards. One of the guards pointed out a foul smell coming from a bag, according to police, and the teen mother, identified as Tiona Rodriguez of Crown Heights in Brooklyn, said she had a baby in the bag. The security guard alerted the NYPD and Rodriguez later explained to the officers that she had given birth on Wednesday and didn't know what to do with the baby, which had reportedly matured about six months in the womb. Other reports say the baby was born alive and then asphyxiated. I, 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 um, I, what, what, what can you say? I mean, you put this together with some of the stuff that Dr. Mueller's been commenting on in regards to euthanasia in, in, um, uh, the Netherlands and places like that, and where now people are pushing to allow euthanasia for children. 
If children think their lives aren't good enough, they can just kill themselves. This is the culture of death. It is ugly, it is evil, and it is a judgment from God. There is absolutely no question about it. You, uh, you close your eyes to the gospel, you decide that you're but an animal, um, and, well, there you go. There you go. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. A um, couple other things need to get to before we take your phone calls, 877-753-3341. I, um, last week, I mentioned uh, that I've, once I got back from South Africa, then, um, you know, in my schedule of things, I've started preparing for the um, debate in uh, December, whenever it is in December, I guess I need to write to, uh, uh, to Brother Chris and find out when we've got this thing scheduled. But sometime in early December, I assume after the first weekend, and uh, where uh, Chris Pinto and I are going to be discussing his uh, documentary, uh, Tears Among the Wheat, a sequel to A Lamp in the Dark. Um, and so... I've had the opportunity now of going through it a couple of times, um, starting in on the various books that I've collected, um, all that kind of stuff. And I was this this was the section I wanted to play last week, but I didn't get a chance to get to it. Now, what you need to understand is in the documentary there is a there there is no pretense of fairness in the documentary. There's it, that's not it's not. This is not a CNN report. We're trying to be journalists, anything like that. The attack upon Konstantin von Tischendorf, the representation of him uh, is just so blatantly m- intended to create in the mind of the viewer a dislike of this man, a distrust of this man, uh, a view of his character as being flawed, et cetera, et cetera, that it's just, it's unreal. And of course, it's, grossly unfair, grossly unfair. I mean, if you read his book on the dating of the Gospels, you'll find that here is a man who, even though he comes out of German scholarship, he is standing for the inspiration of the Bible against the Tübingen school. He is defending the dating of the Gospels against their radical late dating, um, which, of course, he turned out to be right in in regards to the discovery of manuscript P52 and things like that. Um, but his, his motives, even within the book that's cited in the documentary, ignored, not even, no pretense for fairness here at all. It is pure conspiratorial stuff. It, it's just a shame. It really is. And, and, and this isn't just a matter of opinion. This is fact. I mean, anybody who takes time to read the books that are even cited, uh, will see that this is the case. But then you have... I don't know how to describe this. I'm, I'm going to call it the spooky music proof uh, approach. What you do is you make some wild assertion and then you put really spooky music behind it or something with a good dum, 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 dum type of a beat behind it. And this somehow is supposed to prove something. And it happens all the time. I was going to actually have had time to isolate a bunch of the spooky music examples, but we'll get to that eventually. But just to give th- th- this one example, just just caught me, and I just started laughing hysterically the first time I heard this while I was writing. I'm like, seriously, honestly. I mean, and again, the thing that's that's so troubling about this is it's 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 always a mixture of truth that then goes off into Nana Land someplace, and when you do that, you end up damaging the truth. For example, it's talking about the theory of evolution, how the theory of evolution has been extremely damaging to people's Christian faith. Well, that's a given. But, well, here, I just, you got to listen to this. This is, this is from the uh, one hour and 51 minute mark. If you want to download the video from YouTube and then you can check these things out for yourself. Um, here's, Here's from Tears Among the Wheat. Get get ready for a leap of monumental proportions. It might be said that no doctrine has been more devastating to faith in the Bible 
than Darwin's theory of evolution. But was it only coincidence that Charles Darwin himself published Origin of the Species in 1859, the same year that Tischendorf discovered Codex Sinaiticus? Dum, dum, da, 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 dum, dum, da, da, da. <laughs> Dun, dun, da, 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 dun, dun, da, da, da. I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here going seriously. I, I, did I just hear that? And and, and I, when I listened to it the second time, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was there. And and that's how it does it. See, conspiratorial stuff is. Um, could it just be in a coincidence? Well, and it's so easy to make these things up. Here, I and so I came up with them. I've been uh, reading up about uh, about Simonides, and uh, <laughs> there's uh, there was a great controversy over how old he was. And every time someone pointed out an inconsistency in Simonides' story, he would claim that it was because people didn't understand what he was saying because he only speaks Greek and doesn't speak English and had to go through translation. So, so. Well, you know, my biographer didn't get it right, or they didn't understand this, or he didn't translate my letter right, or he always had an excuse. Um, let's just put it this way. I've, I've found a lot of parallels between Simonides and some guy that teaches down in Arlington, Texas. You know what I mean? Some real convenient stuff. But um, interestingly enough, uh, in the biography that was written of him, he was born in 1824, which would have mean that he allegedly wrote the entirety of Codex Sinaiticus, hundreds of thousands of lines, when he was 15. Nah, I don't think so. So then he comes back going, oh, that was an error, and my biographer didn't get it right, and here's all my proof that I was actually born in 1820. 1820. Well, think about that for a second. 1820 and 1824. Rich has got it. You see what's going on here? It's, it could it be a coincidence? Is it just a coincidence that the historical evidence actually proves that Joseph Smith had his first vision in 1824, but... Now the Mormon church says it was 1820, the exact same dates as in regards to Simonides' birth. Proves it. I don't know what it proves, but as long as you say, could that be a coincidence, it proves something. <laughs> oh, my. Oh. Yep. There you go. There you go. So just, but I didn't have any really cool music. If I just put in a little uh, of that music and that, it would have proven my point. I'll have to grab some. You know, it just occurred to me that, that you could say that that was a leap of titanic proportion. That's true, because I know someone else who makes uh, the exact same kind of connections by the name of uh, Gail Ripplinger. You know, uh, is it just a coincidence that uh, there were... 16 tiny slits and then six. Uh, well, uh, don't even want to go there. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but just go look at <clears throat> stuff like that. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you could just go through this and just. Uh, and, and every time there needs to be some connection made between scholars being cited and the theory being promoted, they don't quote scholars, they go to Mr. Pinto himself. To make the transition. He's he's one of the primary people interviewed is the person making the film in the film. So uh, let's just say there are going to be a lot of questions that I think Mr. Pindle is going to really struggle to answer directly um, when you really start um, looking at the sources he's been using and the arguments that uh, he's come up with. So it's going to be going to be interesting. But I, I just thought the 1820, 1824 thing. There you go. And I'm sure I can find a Jesuit someplace in upstate New York. So that's the that's the only other thing you need is I I'm pretty certain that I read somewhere about uh, Joseph Smith encountering a Jesuit. So that's it. There there you go. There you go. 
Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, take a phone call here, and I've got some other stuff I want to play and uh, get to and things like that. But let's uh, start off with uh, Russ. Hi, Russ. Hello, glad to talk to you, Doctor White. Yes, I sir. Wonder if Rich could, I wonder if Rich could find out find the old creaking door for inner sanctum. You could open some of those segments. Uh, with that you... Yeah, I, I remember those. Uh, those great sound effects. Good stuff. I ha- I've been. Wanting to talk to you about uh, John 5.23 and dealing with uh, some Jehovah's Witnesses, which I figure is a uh, uh, custom-made uh, missionary since they come knocking on my door. But 5.23 says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, does that verse tell us that we should worship Christ as we worship Je- uh, God, the Father? Well, uh, in, in talking with Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, you have to be uh, very, very precise and very careful because uh, they're going to focus very much on, on specifics in the text. And uh, so they're going to say, well, uh, the term honor uh, that is used here uh, is not the same thing. Uh, Tema'o is not the same as proskuneo, which is not the same as... Uh, uh, other terms for worship, and so my gut feeling is that Jehovah's Witnesses will probably go there. the The way to present five twenty three is to present it in the flow of John chapter five, and of course, this is something I've done some videos on 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 YouTube, uh, primarily in response to the general abuse of John chapter five by uh, Muslims, who will quote. Verse 19, the son can do nothing of himself unless is this something he sees the father doing, et cetera, et cetera. But what you need to be able to do uh, to utilize this text appropriately is to provide the context, which, uh, you know, you recognize the the healing at the beginning of the chapter uh, of, of the man uh, who had been lame for so many years and yet did not seem to even be thankful toward Jesus uh, and tries to sort of report on Jesus. And then the Jews attack Jesus for having done this on the Sabbath day. And verse 17 says, but he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself am working. What you need to understand is that the Jews recognized what this statement meant. The Jews answered the question, does God break the Sabbath? by recognizing that since God upholds the world, then it is appropriate for him um, to work on the Sabbath. So the stars continue in their orbits and the planets in their orbits and so on and so forth. That is, they recognize that when it comes to the created order, God works on the Sabbath day. And so when Jesus says, my father is working until now and I myself am working, he is claiming a divine prerogative um, to uphold the creation, and in this case, restore the creation uh, on the Sabbath day itself. That's why verse 18 says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, no, the Jews were just wrong about that. But that provides the context for what you've got in 519 and following. And what you've got in 519 and following People who deny the deity of Christ will focus on their verses. People who affirm the deity of Christ will focus on their verses, like verse 23, which clearly presents a parallel in honoring the Father and the Son, which would be utterly inappropriate if we're talking about even the most exalted creature here is not to be honored in the same way the Father is honored. But the reality is what you need to do is to get past the stereotypes and the the surface level dealing with this particular text. And what you need to do is you need to put it in the proper context. That is what Jesus does here is when the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he had called his God, called God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus never denies that. He never says, Oh, you people have completely missed it. What he does is explains that he is not some renegade deity who is in any way, shape, or form uh, detracting from pure monotheism or from the appropriate worship of the Father. He is showing us the perfect unity that exists between the Father and the Son. And so 519 and following 
distinguishes the Son from the Father, distinguishes the mission of the Son from that of the Father. But in the same way, for example, says, uh, verse, verse 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing. And then the term he uses here is af heautu, by himself, unless it is something he sees the Father doing. So here, the Son, it's not, it's not saying that, well, the Son has no power in and of himself, but the Son always works in perfect unity with the Father. He is fulfilling the Father's will as the incarnate one. So when it's, even in one verse, you have the Son can do nothing himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. You, you have the supremacy of the Father, you have the distinction of the Father and the Son, but then, for whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. That's, that cannot even begin to be understood outside of recognition of the deity of Christ. He's talking about divine actions here. He, he's every, he, sa- he says, whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. So in one single verse, you have all the balance that all the heretics miss. You have the balance that refutes oneness Pentecostalism and modalism. You have uh, the, the, the balance that refutes the Arians. Every, every error that people have made, the balance is found even just in one verse, and it continues on from that. And that then becomes the context that makes 523 so compelling. But the problem is, when you're standing at the door, the, the temptation is to get into a verse against verse shooting match, and it generally doesn't accomplish anything. What I have discovered is that when you actually can settle down into a text and walk through it, that's where, well, all, that, that's, that's the whole test, really, of false teaching, is that it cannot survive a verse-by-verse analysis. It, it might survive a single-verse analysis, but it cannot survive a contextual analysis. And that's why uh, when I'm presenting people with the doctrines of grace, I want to walk through John chapter 6. I want to do the whole chapter. I want to go all the way through it. When I'm talking with a Muslim or Jehovah's Witness, I want to go through John chapter 5. I want to, I want to follow it all the way through. Um, I, I want to go to the Carmen Christie with Jehovah's Witnesses and explain the relationship of the Father and the Son. In, instead of just my verse versus your verse, let's do a whole section and see who can walk through it consistently. And once you establish that context and what's really going on, that Jesus is saying, I'm not this renegade deity out there trying to get my own followers. Uh, that's when it has its uh, its real power. So I'll listen to the MP3 about six times there. <laughs> am, am, I, am I right in uh, saying that since Jesus is God, that Jesus never worships Jehovah? Since you have to be, you worship no, something that is greater no, than no, yourself. No, 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 no. Jesus, uh, Jesus is the God Man, and the God Man's not going to be an atheist. So the Son worships, yeah. honors, well, and prays, prays to the Father. But when you he say does, he does worship, yes, and uh, but when you say Jehovah, be careful. Um, it's the it's the uh, the area of the cults to turn Jehovah into a Unitarian name. The name Jehovah refers to the being of God that is shared equally by three co-eternal and co-equal persons. So uh, Jesus would not refer to the Father as Jehovah as if Jehovah was a Unitarian individual. That's why the New Testament uh, authors can identify Father, Son, and Spirit with that one name Jehovah, is because they're not Unitarians. And that's why the Unitarians, like Anthony Buzzard, have to so desperately... Um, attack the texts that identify uh, Jesus as Yahweh. They, they just have to, because if Jesus identifies as Yahweh, it's, it's all over with. The, their, their, their system's over with. And sometimes after a very fruitful discussion, I want to beat my head on the table because I simply do not understand. But uh, since since you have so much spare time now, Doctor, after you're back from Africa... <laughs> yeah, yeah which, is why uh, I'm going, which is why I'm going to Canada on Friday. Yeah, the the, the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have had had so many big changes very recently, including throwing Charles Taz Russell under the bus, and of course you refer, you referenced their new Bible in one of your uh, blogs. Uh, would you ever find time to uh, 
review what they have done and uh, give us a program on that? Well, I'll be honest with you. As I said when I noted it on the blog, uh, the 2013 NWT, I said I will uh, I will look for uh, those who focus upon these things uh, publishing materials because uh, keeping up with the Jehovah's Witnesses, there are a few people who do that. Uh, there was a gentleman I encountered in um, in Germany uh, who keeps up very well with Jehovah's Witnesses and. Um, uh, it's just not something that I can do at this point in time. He has a website? I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Um, uh, no, I, I, well, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But um, what I was saying is uh, I, I would imagine if uh, he were to publish something on some of the, the new developments uh, that I would probably be aware of that and bring that information on on the program. But, but yeah, no, I... I uh, I wish I had the time to, to keep up with the Watchtower Society the way that I did many, many years ago. But many, many years ago, all I was dealing with was Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. And yeah, I could keep up with that. But doing a little bit more than that now. And uh, if I had a staff and if we sat here talking about money and making everybody feel guilty all the time, uh, then maybe maybe I could. But yeah, the chances are uh, I will, I will uh, be a secondary source on that. But I'll keep an eye open uh, and see what... See what happens, and um, certainly we'll let folks know when it uh, when it does it does happen. Thank okay? you very much. All right, thanks for your call. All right, God bless. Bye bye. All right, uh, we'll get to that call in a, in a moment. I wanted to make sure uh, some of you noticed uh, that uh, I posted a uh, article on uh, in response to Dr. Shabir Ali having posted an article about our uh, debate at uh, Pretoria. And uh, I put the first part up yesterday. I still have to write the second part, still working on that. Really not sure how deeply I want to get into some of the citation of sources and things like that. Uh, but um, I, think it's, I think it's useful. And one of the things I mentioned was that when I gave the report on the South Africa trip, I did not have time. I, I went too long in giving too many details. And I didn't have time to play everything I wanted to play. So I wanted to just briefly... Uh, fix that so that someone could at least hear the actual dialogue that is behind the, the central issue in uh, the disagreement that uh, Shabir and I are having over the subject of that debate. So it was during the Q&A uh, where this was as close as we get to cross-examination uh, that he asked me a question and I picked up on it during my part of the Q&A. So I want to play the question he asked me and my response and then play my questions of him that then became the foundation for the comments I made where I said, I, I think Shabir has, has conceded this debate. And I continue to believe that that's the case, um, even more so in light of um, Shabir's article. Because, uh, well, listen for yourself. Here's Here's the question that uh, Shabir asked me and, uh, and my response. Now, you, you cited the Carmen Christie from Puff Philippians uh, uh, chapter 2, uh, where Paul it is obviously referring to the book of Isaiah chapter 45. Now, are you aware that Paul has actually taken a reference to Yahweh and then made that a reference to Jesus? And so, if he has, in fact, here modified the original belief in one God, Yahweh, and now he has made Jesus this. Yahweh. And if Jesus is this Yahweh, then how could Yahweh be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Because in that case, Jesus is not part of the Father, Son, and, and Holy Ghost. You have, you have Yahweh who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then you have Jesus. Explain that. This is the essence of what we're going to have to, you're going to have to come to understand in our book, Shabir. This is what we've got to talk about because this is what, my friend, you do not understand what we believe here. You do not understand it. With all the love in my heart, I, I pray for you, but you don't understand what we believe here. Yahweh refers to the being of God. There are three persons that share that one being, therefore they are identified with that name Yahweh. You are assuming Unitarianism with the name Yahweh, that Yahweh can only apply to one person. That is the fundamental erroneous assumption of Islam that I, I just cannot get my Muslim friends to recognize. You've got to get past it and realize what we're really saying. You are exactly right. What, what I don't think Paul did, because he didn't hear my statement on this. I don't think it's Paul that made this up. 
He's recording it for us. But the only way this could be a sermon illustration to Philippians is if they already know this fragment of a hymn. So what the early church before Paul was already confessing was that the language used of Yahweh in the Old Testament is appropriately applied to Jesus of Nazareth. I know, Shabir, that that's an amazing assertion, but that's the whole assertion of Christianity. That's the only thing that makes sense. You see, you're telling us this, this text of mine is filled with contradictions right and left. Why? Because you demand to enforce this view of God upon it. When you don't make that demand and allow the writers of the New Testament to define their own categories and their own position, all those contradictions all of a sudden disappear. And that's exactly what you request for the Quran. That's what we have to have for the New Testament. So how do I explain it? You're exactly right. To me, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. To what? All to the glory of God the Father. Who is, who is this one God for Paul? We saw it in the Shema, 1 Corinthians 8. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all identified by the one name, Yahweh, has become flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. That is the, the whole primitive message, and you just demonstrated it right there. So, there was his question to me, and my response, and yeah, I'm playing at 1.2 speed, even I can't talk that fast. Um, and so, he had the first section of questions, then I had the opportunity of asking him questions. And I think I did two on this subject, because I felt it was so much the core of the actual uh, debate. So here's, here's what happened. Now, given that our debate was on what are the earliest sources, uh, do these early sources indicate that the followers of Jesus viewed him as God? I gave you the Carmen Christi. And in your question, you seem to have admitted that what we have in the Carmen Christi is a view of Jesus as, as deity, uh, not just in the utilization of a passage about Yahweh, but also in the assertion, I would assume, that he eternally existed in the form of God, so on and so forth. If, in point of fact, that is the Carmen Christi, a hymn to Christ as to God, that predates Paul's utilization of it, does that not establish? Let me put it this way. Can you show me anything earlier than that, that data that would demonstrate that it somehow is not showing that the earliest Christians believe in the deity of Christ and hence fulfilling my burden in this debate? The earliest of this that I mentioned is the Old Testament. We do not have any earlier New Testament writings than the writings of Paul. And uh, Paul has represented New Testament Christianity as uh, the, 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 the winner writing after a conflict. If you want to know the other side of that conflict, we have to start with the realization that the original disciples of Jesus were Jewish monotheists. They would have gotten their theology from the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, there is only one God. And this is the central teaching of the Old Testament. The most important teaching is the first and second commandment of the Ten. Uh, Paul is representing this Christie as a, a, a hymn that he somehow stumbled upon or received, okay? But from whom? At some unknown source. We cannot, uh, based on some unknown source, construct our theology even if he did. That's up to him. Uh, now, in, in Paul using this, uh, this hymn, and uh, representing Jesus in this way, we can see that he has actually departed from the Old Testament because he has taken an Old Testament passage that referred to Yahweh and he has made that refer to Jesus. He is now departing from that original commandment which says that you should have no other God but Yahweh. Clearly Jesus was a human being. In the book of Numbers chapter 23 verse 19, it says God is not a man and not the son of man. So if Jesus is a man to of all appearances, well then you cannot take him to be God, he cannot be Yahweh, he is not Yahweh, and by taking him to be somehow Yahweh, as Paul is now doing in this uh, letter, even in a tantalizing way, uh, Paul is actually departing from the Old Testament scripture. Moreover, Paul has said in his uh, letters that he did not get his teachings from any man, he got it as a revelation from the Christ. So, in that case, we cannot claim that Paul is getting this from the original disciples of Jesus. In other words, this is pure invention on the, on the part of Paul, and there's no reason why Muslims or Christians or Jews should believe in him. You were one second unrest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I have one more on it. Yeah, this is it. Shabir, oh, five seconds, you're right. uh, Shabir, I think you just gave the debate to me. Tell me why I'm wrong. I, the thesis of the debate was, the earliest sources the earliest, which represent the earliest disciples of Jesus, believe the deity of Christ, and you just confirmed that the Carmen Christi does that. And when I asked what earlier sources you have, you went to the Old Testament, which was finished being written 400 years before the Christian church began. So why can't I now say that really your whole argument is that I simply won't accept what the early Christians believe because I interpret the Old Testament differently than they did, but the fact is, the earliest Christians did believe this. I just say that they were wrong. I did not have to debate to you. Uh, what? I've argued that when we know 
for a fact that they were Jewish monotheists, and this is not disputed by anyone, we should not uh, assume that they held to anyone being God other than Yahweh without documentary evidence. As you rightly have said, let's look at the documentary evidence. So what do we have before the disciples? It's the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament teach all Jews, including the early disciples of Jesus, that they should have no other God but Yahweh? Moreover, I have argued that Jesus himself taught that he, he was not God. And, and this is clear in the Gospels, where Jesus, for example, says, Why do you have to call me good? No one is good with God alone. When Jesus said uh, or something that seems to indicate that he doesn't know when the last day will occur, well, that would mean that, that he is not the omniscient God. When it is clear that Jesus has limitations in his power when he tries to heal the blind man twice, for example. Uh, in all of these instances, it is clear that Jesus is a man and not God. Moreover, in Acts of the Apostles, even though the, the story has been rewritten to present the, the disciples of Jesus as though they were towing to some extent the Pauline line, still we see that the disciples of Jesus were simply preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. That is how Acts chapter 5 ends, that they went around everywhere teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. And it is Paul, in chapter 9, verse 20 of Acts of the Apostles, who went into the synagogue and straight away began preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Even Acts of the Apostles recognizes that there is a kind of illusion in the presentation of Jesus. Earlier disciples presenting him as a man, a human being, and the Messiah of God. Uh, later on, Paul raising him to the status of, uh, of Lord and Son of God. And we see this in Paul's writings, when we see that the four Gospels were lined up show a clear distinction between Matthew uh, and Mark and, and, and Luke. And then on the other hand, we see John Gospel saying that Jesus is the mother and his son. It is clear that there is an evolution. So there he gave his uh, evolution uh, presentation as well, which I uh, addressed, um, I think I addressed in the first part. I've already started the second part, so hard for me to remember which part's which. But there, there's that was the foundation. Then, then I made the comments I played last time. And uh, I'm looking forward to having the whole thing out there because I, I'm, look, I'm very confident that when a person just analyzes what was said and the data that was presented... Uh, that they'll see the point that I made, and I, I don't have to. I don't have to try to force it on anybody. It's um, it's pretty straightforward, pretty clear. So, um, but I'm enjoying having the opportunity of, of interacting with the points and maybe clarifying some things and things like that in the article, and uh, should have the second one up uh, as uh, Lord willing before I get out of here this afternoon. Uh, we'll hope that I don't get interrupted by too many things. Anyways, 877-753-3341. Let's uh, talk to Manuel. Hello, Manuel. Hi, Dr. White. How you doing? Good. Good. Um, I heard you call the oneness a cult there, so I, I really wanted to say something about that, kind of defend that. I'm willing to come on here and talk with you any time about those sort of things. Um, I guess I can ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay with you. Well, was there something about what I just uh, said that uh, you can, you, I, I mean, uh, I don't remember specifically using that terminology, but I think I talked about the cults as a, as a whole, and certainly the uh, denial of the distinction that is made between the Father and the Son in verses 17 and 19. Uh, that would probably be the best thing to focus upon. Um, Oneness doesn't deny that distinction, Dr. White. Um, well, uh, obviously, if you think that there was one person who was both the Father and the Son, right? What we deny is the Trinity, because there's no such thing in the Scriptures. That's an oral tradition passed down by, by man, and it's on the same level as Mariology and Popery. I don't even see how you can fight the Catholics. Uh, okay, well, uh, th that's obviously false, but let's let's try no, to focus. Let's true, try to, Manuel. Are you even capable of focusing upon one verse or not? Of course, I am. Okay, then let's then let's try it. Let's try it. Uh, let's try it. Is Jesus both the Father and the Son? Is Jesus both the Father and the Son? Well, I'll tell you, Doctor White. Um, the Father existed before the Son. The Son was born of Mary. Is that true or false? Um, was the Son born of Mary or not? Uh, Jesus Christ was born of Mary. The Son of God has eternally existed. We're asking a question about your position. So, is it your position that Jesus... Well, okay, that's just... We try. It's worthless. Manuel cannot engage in dialogue. It's just... It, we've tried. That's, that's uh, it's at least the second time. It's worthless. He cannot do it. Just don't even bother. The, the, man, the man has no self-control. It would be useful because I'd like to be able to point out that what I said was true. What I say that was true, 
They deny the distinction by making Jesus one person. The Father and the Son, the Son's is human nature, the Father is the divine nature, and 17 and 19 destroys that. But we've, uh, we've debated oneness Pentecostals who can actually control themselves and can engage in meaningful discussion. Manuel is not one of those people. So don't even bother. Uh, you know, just, it's just, I wish, you know, it'd be useful. It'd be useful, but he's he's beyond um, that kind of discussion. Anyways, 877-753-3341. Going back to uh, the situation in regards to the debates, there was one thing that I I did point out, um, and that was that, uh, you know, Shabir said that that James normally is very quick to post a review saying how well he did. And I... uh, I took that a little bit uh, personally uh, because, uh, look, uh, if you look back over the, I've done a lot of debates. I've done more debates than Shabir has. And um, if you look back over the blog over the past, since we started blogging in 2004, you won't find that to be the case. Uh, There have been times when years afterwards, uh, remember what we did with the Jimmy Aiken uh, debate, uh, non-debate, the the, the non-debate debate. Uh, the Bible Answer Man thing, you know, they were they just kept throwing that out there and calling it a debate. And all. So what do we do? Years later, what over a decade, well over a decade later, we played the whole thing and responded to the whole thing, did the whole thing, timed the whole thing, and what you end up with is uh, you know a review a decade down the road. Then what we do with the Patrick Madrid thing? We played the whole thing. We did it fairly, but was that right after the debate? No, it was about a decade later too. So when debates come back up and they're advertised and and you know stuff like that by opponents and things start being said, we might review it. Uh, might take some time. Uh, if something interesting happened at the debate or something like that, you know, I'll I'll give a report. When I go, but the idea. It's pretty obvious. I think any fair-minded person will say, I would rather just let the debate speak for itself. Let people listen to it. Let them make decisions on their own. You know, after we had the debates with Adnan Rashid in uh, London, you know, what I tell you about? I told you about how we had more um, Allahu Akbaring going on uh, in the second debate than we had ever had before. And, uh, but I didn't go through it, uh, so to say, and, oh, and I got him on this, and, oh, and I got him on that. And so what I did when I gave the report was I, I felt like that last debate was the most um, forceful exchange that we had of all of them. And uh, so I, again, uh, I, am, I am Shabir Ali's utter superior in technology <laughs> and and there's no way that he would ever ever deny that um and the reason that i have um these recordings is because did you hear at the end i almost stopped but i didn't want to do it i almost stopped uh, when shabir was talking because did you hear something in the background you heard <laughs> that it's a pen I'm using it to write. You're actually hearing as I'm writing with it, as it's recording stuff. That's what that was, was the sound in the background while he was speaking, because uh, I was making notes on what I wanted to then include in my next rebuttal section and you know stuff like that. Because it's the actual pen that I'm that I'm writing with my notes and stuff like that. So um, that's why I was able to play those sections, and I thought people would find that interaction to be uh, very interesting. I was not trying to do that to try to say ah. I got Shabir because I want people to watch the debates. I want them to, to make the decision for themselves. Uh, look, I do the debates for the long term. I do the debates for the long term. Sometime around age 40, I've told people this a bunch of times, sometime about 10 years ago, woke up one morning and realized, you know what? This life is short and I'm halfway through it. And what you do is you live your life to try to make a difference even after you're gone. And so I am trying to produce a body of material, debates, books, dividing lines, teaching, whatever, 
that will have relevance after I am dust. So uh, doing silly things like playing games with the debates right afterwards would detract from that, not add to that. So I have no interest in doing it. I have no interest in doing it. Uh, are you getting numerous phone calls now? <laughs> Just out of control. Just, you know, uh, amazing. All right, let's talk to uh, Ryan in Phoenix. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Dr. White. How are you? Doing good. Hey, I just wanted to get your take from a reform position on this whole John MacArthur and the Strange Fire Conference, which is blowing up the Twitter sphere and the social media. So uh, my background is actually former Latter-day Saint. You've been a tremendous help to me and my family uh, over the years. Oh, great. And uh, I kind of feel with... Joseph Smith, when he went out to the Grove of Trees, supposedly, to learn which religion was right, I kind of find myself now uh, siding with his views somewhat on, man, I'm just a little confused. I've been studying you and R.C. Sproul and John Piper and MacArthur and the Reform guys for quite some time, and that would be my born-again position. Um, but I just see how to, how to respond to this strange fire thing. I'm a little bit con- confused on the right and the wrong way to reply yeah. or to engage on a local level. I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on the conference and, and some of these people that I hold as heroes of the Christian faith. All right. Well, a lot of people have been asking. Um, I heard very little of the conference. Um, I've, I've actually somewhat resisted the temptation to cut into my study time to uh, download all the presentations and things like that. Uh, but I, what I want to do is I have the book on pre-order for Kindle, and once it comes out, I think sometime late November or something like that, early right. December, then I'll, I'll you know, record it and listen to it because I can do that fairly, fairly quickly. And I just mm-hmm. need to be wise with my time. But um, here's... I, I listened to the Michael Brown program yesterday with Phil Johnson and then with... Uh, Adrian Warnock and Sam Storms, and I've exchanged a few emails, not really so much on that topic, but sort of touched on it with Michael. Um, here's, uh, I, I guess I, I need to take a stand here and be consistent. Here's, here's my feeling. I've been going around the United States for a uh, couple years now, trying to impress upon Christians the necessity to recognize that we cannot do to the Muslims what the Muslims generally do to us. And that is they throw us all into one big old pile and they say, this is what Christians believe. This is what Christians are. They try to hold me accountable for what the Pope says. They try to hold me accountable for what uh, some uh, Looney Tune guys does in burning Qurans or whatever and things like that. And I go, I don't appreciate that. I don't appreciate when I am thrown in with uh, uh, with the, um, uh, oh, who are the wacky guys uh, that show up at funerals? Um, those guys, you know, I, I don't appreciate that. And so we have to be uh, Westboro Baptists. We have to be consistent in making proper, clear, and careful distinctions in regards to anyone that we are criticizing. So when we talk about um, Islam, then we need to differentiate between the Salafi and the non-Salafi, between the Sunni and the Shia, between the, the Muslims who've done some reading and those who have not. I try to make clear distinctions between my opponents who actually listen to what I'm saying and try to form their arguments in light of what they understand of my position and those who don't care at all what my position is. And unfortunately, that's the majority of the people that I, that I debate. They try to push their understanding upon me, so on and so forth. And so I have to be consistent. What I heard of the conference, what I've heard of the conversation yesterday, the proper distinctions in regards to the wide expression of the charismatic movement were not maintained. And so when you when you liken all charismatics to Mormons, you're leaving yourself open to easy refutation. Mm-hmm. When you say the charismatic movement as a whole has never done anything sacrificial or not anything good for morals or ethics, restless things like that, you're leaving yourself open to easy refutation by simply pointing out the fact that there are people who have done these things. The problem is, I am, I am not a continuationist. Um, unfortunately, even those terms, uh, I've I've seen a lot of confusion on. I thought I was an 
I thought I was as much of a cessationist as you could be until a number of years ago I found out that there are actually some Reformed folks who believe that even the gifts of the Spirit to the Church in the sense of discernment or uh, the, the the gifting of certain men, for example, for preaching things, like, they think even that's done away with. So that I would call that almost hyper-cessationism or something like that. But there are people who hold that position. So... I believe that the specific miraculous sign gifts which were given to the apostles to verify their ministry for a specific purpose, and that specific purpose is laid out by Paul in 1 Corinthians in regards to a testimony to the Jewish people, that once that nation no longer existed, and it ceased to exist in AD 70, uh, those gifts would no longer have any purpose. The Holy Spirit is is, uh, the third person of the God of purpose, and therefore there would be no reason to be giving gifts when the purpose of those gifts had now been completed. So I am a cessationist in that sense. I am not a continuationist like uh, Piper or Grudem or others along those lines. Um, And so I just got back from South Africa where what's called the Christian church in South Africa has been devastated by word of faith uh, teaching. Word of faith is a blasphemy. It is it it, it it cannot be denounced in strong enough terms for the destruction that it has wrought amongst uh, amongst simple people of God, and the destruction is brought to, for example, the presentation of the gospel to Muslims and things like that. I that many of the Muslims I talked to, I couldn't even fault them for not understanding what I believe because they never talked to Christians who even understand the doctrine of the Trinity, because it's never taught on in their quote unquote charismatic churches, and so I am. I do believe that the large portion of the charismatic movement, as it is expressed in the world today, is far removed from anything even close to biblical Christianity. But I have to make distinctions. I have to recognize that I can't say, that's everybody, because I know serious Christians who believe in the gospel, who live godly lives, who are orthodox in their beliefs, and they have a prayer language. Now, do I think that comes from the Holy Spirit? No, I don't. I think it's emotional. I think it's primarily something they were taught or something that means has something to mean to them, but I don't think it comes from the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, so we're going to go along here because I don't want to, I want to cut this off. Is that all right? Just, we'll, I'll just let yeah. you know. Really. Um, so, so my concern is that when you make the appropriate, I mean, people like Creflo Dollar and Benny Hinn and, and Hagen and Caps and, and uh, all these people need to be named, they need to be warned about, their teachings need to be exposed, the church needs to stand up and say, stop giving these people your money, they are leeches on the outside of the boot of the body of Christ. That needs to be said with clarity. But the problem is, when you say that, and then don't make the distinctions that need to be made, your argument against them becomes muted because it's too easy to refute the broad-ranging comments that, that you've made without, without making the proper distinctions. And so, again, basically what I wish had happened is some much finer-tipped brushes had been passed out at the Strange Fire Conference um, so that the appropriate distinctions could be made. Because what has the vast majority of the conversation been about over the past couple days? Has it been about the, the coming up with a strategy to help the simple believers in Africa who have been absolutely pummeled by these false teachings to come to know the truth and to free themselves from this kind of stuff? Hasn't been about that. It's been about are there charismatics in other countries or in this country who are doing good things because of the broad brushstrokes that were used. Yeah, and and Michael Brown used that exact same phrase with the broad brush. Oh well, you... everybody has. Everybody has. Mm-hmm. I'm not the only one that has that that has uh, has voiced this tremendous concern. Um, now, I will say, uh, since I've criticized the broad brushstrokes of the conference, um, my my dear brother Michael Brown cannot possibly minister in these churches without knowing what's going on in these places and knowing the teachings because he's talking about being in churches that have bookstores. Does he look in the bookstore? I look in the bookstore of churches I go to. I see what <laughs> books they have there. Uh, so when he says, oh, I, don't, I don't listen to these guys. I don't, I, 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 Michael, 
I, I know you're busy and I know you're focused on other things, but I've got to criticize you there because you, you have to have discernment uh, to recognize what's going on at these churches uh, and that these people are promoting these kinds of things. So, you know, listening especially to the program yesterday when Phil Johnson was on was just painful for me. I love them both. Phil and I have uh, bunked together in Brisbane, Australia and watched the ashes together and, and uh, gone, to, gone to the, uh, the, the wilds of Alaska together where he didn't even get a fish and I got a bear. But anyways, um, uh, <laughs> we've done all this stuff together and I've got pictures of him wearing some of my bow ties and he's a good friend. And mm-hmm. so is Michael Brown. We haven't been able to do stuff like that. We, uh, uh, we've we pretty much either debated together against uh, Anthony Buzzard and Joseph Good or against each other uh, on a number of programs and, and uh, at Southern Evangelical back in February. Um, but still, to, to listen to that and to find myself at some times going, uh, Phil, you're changing the subject. And then, Michael, really, seriously, you don't know what these guys are talking about? It was very painful for me. It was very conflicting. It well, was... and I can think you can, you've can. you ministered to LDS for years, and my, my point was I was raised to believe we had the one true church. And obviously four years ago when the Lord got a hold of me and showed me the heirs of a false god and a false religion, um, you can see me coming out from a Latter-day Saint perspective that I feel kind of gosh, that, that one true church, I mean, where is the the one true church? I, it's harder, Dr. White, for me to unlearn than it is to listen to debate with you and Michael Brown uh, to learn new things. I hope you yeah. can feel my pain with that. So I, I my heart well, goes out to everyone involved with this, because I love people on both sides, just like I love you and Michael Brown. I've right. listened to you guys debate for on YouTube for, for a while now, and I just feel like, gosh, I just this strange fire conference really shook me to the core. And I'm just one of the small guys in local Phoenix, just trying to find a local body that I can be plugged into, to be honest with you. Well, I don't think it should, um, I don't think it should cause that kind of angst. I think the angst that it should cause is um, this is an important subject and the distinctions need to be made appropriately so that we're not uh, doing friendly fire rather than strange fire uh, Mm -hmm. and, and things like that. But, uh, at the same time, you know, in your situation, I'm not sure this is an issue that, that you need to be focused too much on anyways. Uh, I mean, if you're still looking for a place to get plugged into, uh, that's that's something that that is more primary. Uh, I mean, unless the issue of tongues and tongue speaking and things like that is forefront in what you're encountering, well, and it has been with the charismatic movement with some of these mega churches out in the valley. When I left Mormonism, as you can know, I just thought, well, everyone's a part of the body of Christ. Well, right. now I'm slowly starting to learn, obviously, about the Reformation and the five solas. Like, my my knowledge in the past five years, the Spirit's really gotten a hold of my heart through the words of Christ, and, and specifically the Old and New Testament, and obviously with you and a lot of my heroes in the faith. And and honestly, I am. I'm a, I'm a little bit let down with the amount of biblical teaching or, or lack thereof in some well, of the local Christian churches around <laughs> the valley. Well, well, Ryan, uh, realize I've, I've said many times, I, I believe we live in a day where this culture is under the judgment of God, and mm-hmm. a discerning, unified, uh, clear-speaking church is a blessing upon a nation. And um, I think the reason that we have so much false Christianity and um, uh, just just Christ denying liberalism in our in our land is a part of the judgment upon our land. But remember, biblically, there were those periods of time during uh, Elijah's ministry, for example, where he thought he was the last one left. There was right. nobody else left, and God had to, in that still small voice. Uh, remind him that he still had 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal, but he had reserved them to himself. So the point is that if we live during a day when we are called to be a prophetic voice, to be salt and light, uh, to testify of the evil deeds of uh, of the generation in which we live, um, that may not be comfortable, and that may also mean that we have to really practice the art and gift of discernment, that we need to be constantly keeping our eyes on Christ and not looking at men and not placing our trust in the arm of the flesh or anything like that. And uh, you may be getting a, a rushed uh, education in those things, but uh, trust me, uh, you have it a whole lot better here than uh, some of the places I've been overseas. 
Amen. Uh, where, it's, I where it's even it. worse. <laughs> yeah, amen. Well, hey, I, I thank you, Dr. White, for all your years of service, especially to my Latter-day Saint friends and family. At a, at a time, I was with Daniel Peterson and the Farms Group, and I was actually pretty much against you and the whole quote-unquote anti-Mormon, and I just have been brought to tears these past four years, and I want to publicly apologize to you. Uh, um, well, Ryan, for... trust, trust me, you don't need to apologize to me. Um, I'm I'm simply a minister of the gospel, and as such, I, I cannot take personally the um, attacks that I've experienced from uh, from folks who follow the old farms, which doesn't really even exist any longer, right. uh, and so on and so forth. That's that's just what it means to show love for the Mormon people, to go up to the General Conference every six months and stand there and, and take uh, the abuse that we did take because of yeah. the fact that you know God still has his people uh, there amongst the Mormons. He's going to call them by the grace of Christ, and you're that's an example right. of that, and we know of others as well. So Amen. no, no well, need for any— you. I, I, I love you as a brother in Christ. I look forward to meeting you someday, and uh, God bless you, Dr. All White. right, thanks, Ryan. Thanks for calling. God bless. All right, bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. All right, well, I went a little over on that, but I wanted to do so just because uh, everybody wants to know what I have to say about it anyways. So there. Um uh, there, there you go. But it was an interesting context, actually, uh, for Ryan's call. All right, thanks for listening to The Buying Line today. We'll be back on Thursday, headed for Vancouver on Friday. Get to see all of you up there. Get to see Grey Level, Lord willing, uh, while we're up there. Uh, looking forward to that and uh, the Solo Scriptura conference up there. And that's it for October. It better be, because there ain't going to be much left in October after that anyhow. Hey, we'll see you next time on The Dividing Line. God bless.